the music of the birds. <coughs> Nor can we longer hear the tales of great deeds, for the stories of our mothers that they tell today are but those of sorrow, grief, and tears. What then is patriotism? <laughs> patriotism, sir, is the last resort of scoundrels, said Dr. Johnson. Leo Tolstoy, the great anti-patriot of our times, defines patriotism as the principle that will justify the training of wholesale murderers, a trade that requires better equipment for the exercise of killing than the making of such necessities of life, like shoes, clothing, and houses, a trade that guarantees better returns and greater glory than that of the average worker. Gustav Herr, another great anti-patriot, justly calls patriotism a superstition. And he says, one far more injurious, brutal, and inhumane than religion. The superstition of religion originated in humanity's inability to explain the natural phenomena. That is, when early humanity heard thunder or saw lightning, they could not account for either and therefore concluded that the back of them must be a force greater than themselves. Similarly, they saw a supernatural force in the rain and in the various other changes of nature. Patriotism, on the other hand, is a superstition artificially created and maintained through a network of lies and falsehoods. A superstition that robs a person of their self-respect and dignity and increases their arrogance and conceit. Indeed, conceit Arrogance and egotism are the essentials of patriotism. Let me illustrate. Patriotism assumes that our globe is divided into little spots, each one surrounded by an iron gate. Those who have had the fortune of being born on some particular spot consider themselves better, nobler, grander, more intelligent than the living beings inhabiting any other spot. It is therefore the duty of everyone living on that chosen spot to fight, kill, and die in the attempt to impose their superiority upon all others. The inhabitants of the other spots reason in like manner, of course, and with the result that from early infancy, the mind of the child is poisoned with blood-curdling stories about the Germans, the French, the Italians, the Russians, etc. <laughs> When the child has reached adulthood, they are thoroughly saturated with the belief that they are chosen by the Lord himself to defend their country against the attack or invasion of any foreigner. It is for that purpose that we are clamoring for a greater army, navy, more battleships, more ammunition. The awful waste that patriotism necessitates ought to be sufficient enough to cure a person of even average intelligence from this disease. Yet patriotism still demands more. The people are urged to be patriotic, and for that luxury they pay, not only by supporting their defenders, but by sacrificing their own children. Patriotism requires allegiance to the flag, which means obedience and readiness to kill father, mother, brother, sister. The usual contention is that we need a standing army to protect the country from foreign invasion. Every intelligent man and woman knows, however, that this is a myth, maintained to frighten and coerce the foolish. The governments of the world, knowing each other's interests, do not invade each other. They have learned that they can gain much more by international arbitration of disputes than by war and conquest. Indeed, as Carlyle said, war is the quarrel between two thieves too cowardly to fight their own battle. Therefore, they take boys from one village and another village, stick them into uniforms, equip them with guns, and let them loose like wild beasts upon one another. We Americans claim to be a peace-loving people. We hate bloodshed. We are opposed to violence. Yet we go into spasms of joy over the possibility of projecting dynamite bombs from flying machines upon helpless civilians. We are ready to hang, electrocute, or lynch anyone who, from economic necessity, will risk their own life in an attempt upon some of that industrial magnate. Yet our own hearts swell with pride at the thought that America is becoming the most powerful nation on earth. 
that it will eventually plant her iron foot on the necks of all other nations. Such is the logic of patriotism. Considering the evil results that patriotism is fraught with for the average person, it is as nothing compared with the insult and injury that patriotism heaps upon the soldier, that poor, deluded victim of superstition and ignorance. He, the savior of his country, the protector of his nation, what patriotism is in store for him? A life of slavish submission, vice, and perversion during peace, a life of danger, exposure, and death during war. There is a solidarity awakening the consciousness of even the soldiers, they too being the flesh of the flesh of the great human family, a solidarity that has proven infallible more than once during these past struggles, and which has been the impetus inducing the Parisian soldiers during the Commune of 1871 to refuse to obey when ordered to shoot their comrades. It has given the courage to the men who mutinied on Russian warships during recent years. It will eventually bring about the uprising of all oppressed peoples and the downtrodden against their international exploiters. The proletariat of Europe has realized the great force of that solidarity and as a result inaugurated a war against patriotism and its bloody specter militarism. <laughs>